The average salary for a DevOps engineer in 2022 is $130,000, with some people in the high end reporting over $400,000 of total compensation. Companies like Microsoft, Google, and Apple are all competing for engineers. In addition to high salaries, skilled engineers can expect company equity, 401k matching plans, flexible work style schedules, and remote-only positions. So what is DevOps, and what does a DevOps engineer do? DevOps is the field where engineers face challenges every day, looking to automate and monitor software and infrastructure pipelines. In a nutshell, DevOps is a combination of software development philosophies, practices, and tools to increase an organization's ability to rapidly deliver applications and services. It is often associated with the philosophy to codify everything, including the infrastructure itself. DevOps engineers implement automations that help test and deliver code through every stage of a software pipeline. In a DevOps culture, barriers between development and operation teams are reduced. Operations teams are more aware and involved in the development process, and developers are able to innovate and deliver updates more frequently. In today's world, DevOps engineers have become the job description for engineers that are skilled in software and development pipelines, cloud architecture, infrastructure as code, containers, orchestrators, GetOps, and monitoring and observability. In this video, we'll be looking into each of these key areas. Keep in mind, you don't need to be an expert in all these areas. A lot of DevOps positions may require you to only be responsible for pipelines, while others may have you dedicated to using tools like Terraform and Ansible to provision and maintain infrastructure. However, whether or not your plan is to specialize in a specific niche in DevOps, it's important to have a working understanding of all the key areas. If getting a job in the hottest sector of tech right now is something you're interested in, then stick around for this roadmap skills for a DevOps engineer. Linux Fundamentals Before we get into the main skill sets a DevOps engineer should have, it needs to be mentioned that operating knowledge of Linux is a must. Linux is a fundamental building block to almost everything an engineer touches. Understanding Linux will help you with building pipelines, automations, and containerizing applications. Although there are still opportunities for Windows administrators, the industry heavily favors engineers that have a skill set that includes Linux. At the very least, if I was hiring an engineer, I would expect them to know the following. Basic Linux commands, manipulating shell output, Ability to create simple bash scripts. Software installation and package management. Understanding of system architecture. Basic administrative knowledge of users, the file system, and services. All these skills can be learned on your own in a cloud environment, through a virtual machine, or by using Linux as your daily operating system. Now that we have the groundwork laid, let's get into software development and pipelines. One of the key responsibilities of a DevOps engineer is to automate the deployment and delivery of code. In order to build production grade software pipelines, you will need to know and understand how to use source control management tools like Get and GitHub. You should also have some working knowledge of the software lifecycle, as well as know how to make simple scripts using a programming language of your choice. This knowledge will better prepare you for building software pipelines to deliver code to development, testing, staging, and production environments. Git is the de facto tool used in software development for version control. It allows you to commit code to repositories so it can be shared and worked on by other developers. Branching strategies allow developers to work on the same code base, yet isolate their changes so they don't interrupt each other. At some point down the line, code is merged back to a main branch so the new functionality or bug fix can be rolled out to users. As a DevOps engineer, you should be familiar with how to do the following. Initializing repositories, creating and working with branches, pushing code changes to repositories like GitHub, creating pull requests for the repository to pull your changes, and a basic understanding of how to resolve merge conflicts. In regards to source control repositories, GitHub isn't your only option. There are other solutions out there such as GitLab and Bitbucket. However, I wouldn't hire any engineer that doesn't have an understanding of how to use GitHub. So make sure learning it is a priority. Let's now talk about the software lifecycle, which has five key phases. 
the planning and coding phase, where new features are planned and code is developed, the build phase, where the code goes through simple integration and unit tests and the code is built, the testing phase, where more in-depth automated synthetic testing occurs to help discover any unforeseen bugs, the release and deployment phase, this is where code artifacts are released and deployed to environments. The operate and monitor stage. This is when your code is operating in production and monitored for stability. As a DevOps engineer, you will be responsible for various things during this life cycle, mainly through the creation of CI CD pipelines. Continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines are ways to automate the tasks that need to be done at all stages of the software pipeline. Some of the most popular CI CD tools used right now are Jenkins, Circle CI, and GitHub Actions. Let's have a look at an example pipeline. A developer works on some new code and commits changes to a GitHub repository. This initiates a webhook to trigger a Jenkins pipeline. The Jenkins server then checks out the code from GitHub and starts running some tests and build tools against it. It might even use something like Docker to create a container image of the application and then spin up that container and run some synthetic tests on it. Once the tests are complete, it can move on to the release and deploy stage where it might check the container image into a repository and notify the upstream environments that it's ready for deployment. Most DevOps pipelines will follow a flow similar to the one just described. As an engineer, it will be up to you and your team to decide on the best way to automate the flow of your code so the least amount of human intervention is required for deployments. The more automated and streamlined you can make your pipeline, the easier it will be to deliver code to your customers. Later in this video, we'll touch on GitOps and continuous deployment, which takes pipelines one step further and allows you to automate the deployment of your code to production environments. Cloud and system architecture. One thing that separates a DevOps engineer from a software engineer is their depth of knowledge of infrastructure and cloud services. As a DevOps engineer, one of your main responsibilities may be codifying the infrastructure, which is not something that can be done without baseline knowledge of how that infrastructure works. Most organizations make use of cloud services for their infrastructure and will use one or a combination of the three major cloud players. Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. My advice is to choose one of these platforms and stick with it until you're very comfortable with the main services that they offer. Once you learn one platform, it makes it a lot easier to learn the other ones as they all offer similar services. Out of these three platforms, most people start with AWS. It's been around the longest and most organizations already have a footprint in there making it the most marketable skill for an engineer to have. The primary AWS services that you should be aware of are EC2 instances, load balancers, and auto-scaling groups, VPC connectivity, and how it relates to subnetting, routing, and availability zones, S3 storage, IAM administration and basic security principles, managed databases, such as Amazon RDS, and finally, Lambda functions. These aren't the only services that you'll need to know, but they are definitely core services that you will almost certainly work with. One good way to learn AWS is to study for the AWS Practitioner Certification Exam. There is plenty of free training out there and it'll give you a rundown on the basics of what you need to know to work with AWS. Infrastructure as Code Infrastructure as Code is a huge part of DevOps and my personal favorite topic. There's nothing quite like writing some infrastructure configuration files and bringing up development or production systems with just a few commands. So what is infrastructure as code? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's your infrastructure codified. Infrastructure as code tools allow you to define your infrastructure and deploy and manage that infrastructure across multiple cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and GCP. This allows you to make sure your environments are configured in a concise and consistent manner. If you're using infrastructure as code, you know that your development environment is configured the same way as your test, which is also the same as production. It also allows you to automate things and make use of version control systems like Git, which is pretty awesome. 
Currently, the most popular infrastructure as code tool out there is Terraform, but another popular tool is Pulumi, which allows you to implement infrastructure as code using programming languages like JavaScript, C Sharp, and Python. There's also solutions native to each provider. AWS has CloudFormation, Azure has resource templates, and Google has Deployment Manager. Configuration management is closely related to infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is more about provisioning the larger pieces of the infrastructure like the load balancers, databases, and EC2 instances, whereas configuration management gets down to the nitty gritty configuration details, usually, but not limited to the OS layer. When it comes to configuration management, there's four big players in the configuration management game. Chef, Puppet, Salt, and Ansible. Chef and Puppet are the OG's tried and true solutions, whereas Salt and Ansible are the new players. Ansible is the one most organizations are implementing. The main benefits of Ansible is that it is agentless and the configurations are pretty simple to learn. With Ansible, all you need is a playbook and an inventory file. The playbook contains your configurations that you want to run on your hosts, and the inventory file contains your list of hosts. When you run a playbook, Ansible connects to the host via SSH and configures them. This can allow you to configure hundreds of devices by running a single playbook. Playbooks can make use of variables and inventory files can be set up to be dynamic, allowing you the maximum amount of flexibility to configure the devices as required. If you're looking for certification for Ansible, take a look at what Red Hat has to offer. Red Hat has a few certification options, with the Red Hat Certified Engineer being the most popular one. Containers and orchestrators are another fundamental topic that you need to know in software engineering and DevOps. You can think of containers like virtual machines, without the extra overhead of the resources required for the OS. Containers allow you to package up all the components of your application, like the binaries, configuration files, and file system into a container which can be uploaded to a repository and downloaded onto any machine using a tool like Docker. So instead of operation teams having to manually set up applications, they simply run a Docker run command and the application is up and running. Docker is currently the application of choice for container development and Kubernetes is the most popular orchestrator for running containers. Kubernetes uses multiple servers to form a cluster that can manage your container workloads. Instead of having to manage containers on individual servers, you can provision a Kubernetes cluster and provide it with a declarative configuration for how your container workload should be run. This declarative configuration is configured through a YAML manifest file to organize containers into pods, which is the smallest building block of Kubernetes. Pods are a logical way to group one or more containers together. Containers within a pod share the same resources such as storage and an IP address. When an engineer applies a manifest file to the Kubernetes API, master nodes schedule the pods to run on worker nodes based on the requirements, such as CPU, memory, or system architecture. Many companies are adopting Kubernetes, so it should be a key skill for you to learn on your DevOps journey. If you're looking to get certified in Kubernetes, a good exam to shoot for is the KCNA or CKA. GetOps is the latest trend of DevOps and something that is picking up a lot of traction in the industry. GetOps, put simply, is using Get as the single source of truth for your infrastructure. Earlier, we discussed Terraform, Ansible, and Kubernetes, all of which are maintained through configuration files that you can commit to Get. With GetOps, instead of engineers applying changes manually, we have these changes applied automatically when there is a new commit on the repository. This is done either through a push or pull model. A push model is similar to an application pipeline that you might build on Jenkins or CircleCI, where a commit triggers tests, and after the tests pass, the pipeline issues a command to apply the changes to the environment. In a pull model, an agent is installed into the environment and it constantly pulls the repository for what's known as the desired state. It then compares it to the environment's actual state to determine if there are any differences. If the desired state is different than the actual state, it will pull down and apply the changes necessary. A popular pull-based GetOps tool is Argo CD. Argo CD sits in a Kubernetes cluster and uses a pull-based model to sync the changes to the cluster. GetOps' use of source control allows teams to work together and have a clear visibility into changes that are being made. 
It also allows for easier deployments and rollbacks. As discussed, changes to a GitOps repository will automatically update the infrastructure. But what happens if the changes cause problems? Since everything is in a source control repository like Git, if anyone makes changes that breaks the environment, a simple Git revert can reverse the actions of the last commit, bringing you back to a stable environment. The last major item on the roadmap to becoming a DevOps engineer is monitoring and observability. When I first got into DevOps, this was one of the most confusing areas to learn as it includes such a vast spectrum of tools. But it's actually not as complicated as it needs to be when it's broken down. So here are the five key areas that you should be aware of when it comes to monitoring and observability. Infrastructure monitoring, application performance monitoring, log aggregation, visualizations, and alarm aggregators. Infrastructure monitoring is your bread and butter traditional monitoring that you are likely already familiar with. It's all your health and performance data like CPU and memory usage as well as system uptime. Most modern tools support some level of infrastructure monitoring. A lot of these tools integrate with cloud providers using APIs, but also have the option of using an agent to gather more granular data. Application performance monitoring is a way to monitor how your application is performing. Things like request count, throughput, queue time, errors, and memory footprint are all measured in the application. Think about an application like Netflix. They likely have metrics for just about anything the user does in the application. They likely monitor things like how long it takes for the application to first start up, as well as how long it takes to start playing the show after a user presses play. This really gives you insight to how your application is performing and what your user experience is like. Log aggregation. Applications and servers generate a lot of log data. There are logs for the operating system and services, as well as log data from your application itself. This log data sits on every one of your servers, which may be hundreds or even thousands of servers. Log aggregation is the process of collecting, standardizing, and consolidating log data. The log data is then usually optimized to allow for fast search, making it much easier to find those needle in a haystack problems. Visualizations. Nowadays we collect a lot of data, but this data is not all that helpful unless we can visualize it and see how it changes over time. That's what visualizations and dashboards are all about. Using tools like Grafana or Kibana, you can visualize what's happening in your application and infrastructure and detect problems that would otherwise go unnoticed. Alarm aggregators are platforms that will take in alarms from your other systems and give you a bird's eye view of what's going on, as well as cut tickets and page out to on-call personnel. The most common one that you're going to run into is PagerDuty, which integrates with most monitoring and ticketing systems. As a DevOps engineer, you will likely have a hand in the role of most of these types of monitoring solutions. Likely you'll be responsible for making sure all aspects of the infrastructure and application are monitored, as well as have to manage thresholds. It's also likely that you'll be involved in shipping the log data to your log aggregation systems like Elasticsearch or Splunk, and create some visualizations using tools like Grafana. So that's it for your DevOps roadmap. If you're intimidated by the content of this video, don't stress out. All these concepts you'll be able to pick up over time. By no means do you need to be an expert on all the topics I mentioned, but you should have an idea of what each of them are. If you can, take some time and take a deep dive into some of these major topics. A great starting point is learning tools like Terraform, Ansible, and Docker. I have plenty of videos on all the concepts mentioned in this video, and will be uploading more tutorials and playlists in the future. If you liked what you saw in this video and want to start your journey to becoming a DevOps engineer, please hit that subscribe button. And if you want to help me out, like or share this video and leave a comment below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.